We talked a little bit about this last week, the significance of neighboring Jesus and the greatest commandment ever, love your neighbor as yourself. And he invites us into this space of unfolding the goodness of God and the justice of God in ways that our neighbors need. But it begins with you knowing them, that we can extend that love to them. And we're going to give you tools all summer long to be the absolute best neighbor you possibly can be. Use the magnet. Take one per household that are on the seats. Now, if you happen to be a snowbird kind of person, like we had friends in California who in the summertime they lived in Painesville, Minnesota. And in the wintertime they lived in Anaheim, California. They had two sets of neighbors. And they were challenged to know their neighbors as they go. Maybe you've got cabin neighbors. Maybe you've got somewhere else neighbors, Arizona neighbors, Florida neighbors. You know where you go. Wherever you go, know them and love them. And and as we go through this series, Good Neighbor, we're going to build into God's vision for neighboring, why that's so important. And as we, we unfold that vision, also very practically, how do we live it out? Over and over and over, we watch the way of Jesus. We watch him teach. Jesus talks more about being a good neighbor than he does being a good husband or a good wife. Of all the things we could talk about, he talks more about being a good neighbor than he does talk about being a good parent. There's something meaningful to the way we live our lives into the lives of other people. And last week, we started with the great commandment. As we go into the conversation today, we want to go from great to greatest and back again. So great, greatest, and back to great. And it all unfolds in Matthew. If we were to take Matthew's gospel to get to the great commission at the end of his gospel before Jesus uh, ascends back into heaven, as Jesus is teaching, he lines out this framework of greats. And those greats fall this way. The great invitation found in Matthew 11. Come to me, all of you who are weary. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We always talk about what is it that Jesus is inviting us into? What is he calling us into? And that that invitation begins by, by learning from Jesus. When we get to the Great Commission at the end of the book, Jesus says, teach them everything I've taught you. And we start to peel that teaching back. We find these beautiful teachings like the Sermon on the Mount that that Jesus just unfolds. This is how you live. And he uncomplicates the weight of religion and puts it fully into a relationship of loving God and loving neighbor. When you watch the the Sermon on the Mount, it, it hangs on that greatest commandment. Jesus teaches us in that invitation that there is a way of life that is is better than anything that we can know. He invites us to it. Then we get to the greatest commandment. In Matthew's gospel, it's in Matthew 22. We find it in other gospels because it's such a profound teaching of Jesus's. And the challenge before he is crucified, when he lays this out, to love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, And to love your neighbor as yourself, on those two things hang all of the law and all of the prophets. Essentially, everything that the world was taught about who God is and how we live under God's reign, because he's king, is found in loving God and loving neighbor. And if we just did that, we would experience and express the kingdom of God throughout all the world. And so Jesus teaches these things, and not far from Matthew 22, he is arrested, tried, murdered, crucified, buried, and he raises again. And it says for 40 days, Jesus remained in his resurrected form with his disciples and taught them more. And just before he ascended into heaven, His final commissioning is found in Matthew 28. And the question we have to ask is, was this just for those disciples 
or was it for everyone who would call Jesus king? I'm going to have to grab into the words of Paul who says that all of Scripture was breathed out by God and is useful for training, for correcting, for rebuking the person of God to prepare them for every good work. Which means these Scriptures are for us today too. The Great Commission. And it begins like this. And and Jesus came and said to them, All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. We could stop there. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And I could go for years of preaching and thinking of how we could live into that. The New Testament and the Old Testament both will unfold different ways that authority works. When Paul says that we're more than conquerors, it's because of the authority of Jesus. When we're told that no weapon formed against us can proper, it's because of the authority of Jesus. When we're told that nothing seen or unseen, above or below, physical or spiritual, can possibly separate us from the love of God. It is because of the authority of Jesus. And when we see that all broken things will be made new, it's because of authority given to Jesus. And it echoes all the way from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It starts there. So, so here's the thing. Like You ever like... Have you ever been in a situation where um, someone starts telling you what to do? Like, think, anybody have siblings in the room? If you don't know this about me, I'm an only child. I know that explains a lot. Any only children in the room? I really am alone. (laughs) Well, God bless you for having brothers or sisters. I have watched sibling rivalry in my home. And you know one of the things that happens when one sibling, no matter how old or how young, begins to tell another sibling what to do? Do you know what words begin to come out of their mouths? You're not mom and dad. Who made you the boss? Sometimes we tell that to our spouses. Who made you the boss? Bing, bing, you did. I'm not telling you which spouse is saying what in that situation. But who made you the boss? What authority do you have to tell me what to do? That's what the kid's asking. When we would leave... And this is even more true now that we have younger children again. And the older uh, grouping is often left at home. If Corey and I go out, who has the final say? And we have to say, this person's in charge when we leave. Whatever they say is just as if mom and dad said it too. So when Jesus says, all authority, Authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. What's missing? When he talks about authority, and here there's something about authority. Like, like sometimes you have someone who likes to boss you around, but they don't have the ability to fulfill what they're bossing you into. Or they don't know what they're talking about to begin with, and they're trying to tell you to do something that they don't even know what they want you to do. That feels common to a lot of our workplaces, or some of our educational places, or some of our life experiences. How can you tell me what to do when you don't have the ability to do it yourself, and you don't know what you're talking about? And we start to judge people in those categories, but Jesus has the ability and the wherewithal to accomplish everything he has said. Nothing that Jesus has said will fail to come to pass. By his own good measure, the triune God will fulfill his will over all of creation, whether you like it or not. And his will unfolds in love and truth and grace. 
And as part of that will, he has brought people who dare to call Jesus king. And I mean dare because it is a way of life that is countercultural on every step of the way. It is an invitation to an incredible life. But it is a dare to live well. Like Jesus dares us to live well. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore. Okay, because I have everything under control, you do this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. The tension in the passage is a hard one. Not everyone in the nations will be a disciple. It doesn't say to disciple all of the nations. It says to make disciples of all nations. There will be people, no matter how sweet the invitation to Jesus is, they will find a reason to refuse and reject what's good and gracious. We've seen it all the way back to Genesis 3, where where humans have found a different way to live outside of the way of God. We continue to suffer the consequences of that. But Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them everything that I have taught you. Now here's a cool connection in Matthew. No other gospel contains more of Jesus' teaching than Matthew's gospel. So it makes sense at the end of it. If this is the way of the kingdom, Sermon on the Mount where the book begins, then this is how we live it. We want others to live it too. Go teach them what to do. Make disciples. Teach them everything. Baptize them. Help them identify with me. Baptism's all about identification. Does my soul align with the way of Jesus? Do I want to identify with Jesus? You know, in just a few uh, short weeks, NFL training camp will open, and some of you cannot wait to break out your Fran Tarkington jerseys. The good old days, four Super Bowl appearances, sometimes you hang your hat on what you can, right? And we will identify with the Vikings, Cowboys, Packers, I'm sorry. It's so complicated on this border, you know? But we'll identify with somebody somewhere, and we'll do it unashamedly, no matter how terrible our teams are. No matter the character or the quality of person on our teams, no matter the way the coach conducts himself, no matter the win-loss record, we will identify ourselves with that team. Baptism is about identification. When you were baptized in the ancient world, it was not a uniquely Christian practice. It was something that, that, that everybody saw. The rabbis were doing it. The Greeks did it. You would baptize yourself to say, I am committed to this person. I'm going to follow their teaching. I am part of this crew. I'm in this way. It became a uniquely practiced Christian practice during the way of Jesus after the, the ascension. And as he was building the church forward to the book of Acts. But it's about identifying. Help people identify with me. How do people identify with Jesus? By knowing what he did, knowing who he was, and living it out. And that's what we're talking about through this. Everything that he taught them to bring it forward, live it out, and to know that he will be with us always, even until the end of the age. Not only does Jesus have all authority, and then he instructs us in a way to go, this great commission, but he also says, I'm going to be with you in it. You're not alone. If I'm telling you to do it, I'm going to empower you for it, and I'm still with you. But then something happened. This is the hard part of today's message, by the way. All the, the great commissioning stuff is exciting. Something happens in the course of human history, as it always does. And as that something happened, we exchanged great for good enough. We do that a lot. I heard someone say recently that that people will always, always exchange. The reason why people don't see success in life is they will exchange 
what they most want for what they want right now. Think about that for a minute. We'd rather have something right now, so I will exchange what I most want for something lesser. And would you believe that the church did the same thing? We made some exchanges and we made some compromises historically that have got us to where we are today. And part of what we saw, especially like somewhere around the mid-19th century, in American Christianity in particular, we reduced the greatest teachings of Jesus to minor impositions. We began to argue about what we think and what, what this person should do or what that person should do. And as we began to argue about it, we actually reduced the impact of the greatest things Jesus invited us to and called us to these minor impositions of faith. We we took the the great invitation of Jesus to come to him, to sit under him, to sitting in church on Sundays. Just come to church. It's going to be okay. In the way of Jesus, I would rather my kids sit under him than sit in church any day. If my kids sit under Jesus, they will find themselves connected to other people who do the same. But you can sit in church and never, ever see the impact of faith. But somehow we redacted the invitation to sit under Jesus, to learn from him, to have the easy yoke and to live into the abundant life, to just come to church on Sundays. And that's even smaller than it was in the 19th century, because in the mid-19th century it was Wednesday night and Sunday morning and Sunday night. And now it's just come on Sunday morning. We've exchanged great for good enough. We took the the greatest commandment in reducing holistic devotion to God and justice to my neighbor to casual charity. I'll give a little to church. That'll show my devotion to God. I give a little to the homeless person on the street corner. I'm loving them. My neighbor can borrow my rake. It's not holistic justice, it's not whole devotion. But somehow we've we've taken these pieces of this this complete commitment to God and others and we've reduced it down to just this imposition, almost an inconvenience of how faith can be lived out. And part of that tension was because of what we call the social gospel where where some people decided that, that, that the most important thing was to do social work on behalf of others, to be hyper charitable, and, and maybe we won't, we won't preach so much. And then others, no, 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 we have to only preach and not do all that other stuff that gets in the way. And because of our arguing, we stop loving. To love is to bring all the teaching of Jesus with all the kindness of Jesus together. And the Great Commission, what we're talking about today, was reduced from engaging the world with truth and love to waiting for people to engage our programs. You guys ever see the movie Field of Dreams? A couple of years ago, uh, they were going to rebuild the original baseball park in Illinois so that people could go to it and walk through the cornfields and, and see baseballs hit. And then the pandemic happened, so it kind of killed the whole anniversary thing, but then you still got to go later. Celebrating the, the Chicago Black Sox. And the phrase in the movie that would whisper in the background, if you build it, they will come. If you build it, they will come. If you build it, they will come. And so this farmer took his cash crop and he got rid of all the the wheat or the corn and he, he builds a baseball field and all of his farmer friends thought he was crazy. And then one night all the lights come on and all these baseball ghosts come walking into the cornfield to play baseball. And Darth Vader's voice was there. It was great. (laughs) I told you they would come. But we've treated church like that. We took the great commission that says to go into the world and said, if we just build better looking places and have really cool music and all these things and their pastors wear t-shirts, then people will show up. And people did show up. 
The American church saw growth that has happened nowhere else on the planet consistently coast to coast. There are churches that will blow our numbers away worldwide, but they're in countries of people that have a billion listed, not in the millions. When we built bigger buildings and created fancier programs, we hired more professionals, and somehow, somehow, we said we were accomplishing the Great Commission by waiting on the people we were told to go to to come into our spaces. It's good enough. The registers of heaven are still being changed. We celebrate that. It's awesome. People are still saying yes to Jesus. Kindness is still being exercised. There are programs out there. But what happened in that is that we shifted the great ways of Jesus from personal intentionality to professional responsibility. So that the things that all of us together who believe in Jesus should be doing, we said, let's just hire some people to do that and we'll show up when we need to. That is the Western way of doing church. It's the American way of doing church. Now, I may be talking myself out of a job here, but I tell you, if 300 people who call Cornerstone home were to exercise the way of faith into the way Jesus invited us to, you wouldn't need me on the stage. That'd be pretty cool. I'd join you. Let's make that a mission. Let's live the faith so well we don't need Pastor Jeremy anymore. I would join you so quickly in the process. Because we would be so radical as a church, as a people who love Jesus together, our community would be so blessed, so blessed, if we own the intentions of the great commandment, invitation, and commission. We can get there, right? When we reduce those things, we don't honor Jesus in this. If he's saying this is the greatest stuff, when we reduce those teachings... We're not honoring what God called us to do. And maybe we're not honoring the one who called us to do it as well. And that's the hard part of something like this. And maybe we shouldn't have had a hard conversation on Father's Day because we don't want to put guilt on anybody, right? It's a celebration. Go barbecue. And yet the text calls us into this. So what do we do? How do we become great again? Now, I don't mean like MAGA great. I'm not a political guy. You guys know that, right? I'm a Jesus guy, and when Jesus says this, then maybe I'll vote that way. Or when Jesus says that, maybe I'll vote that way. But, but we live in a place of becoming great again. Like that says, echoed in the United States under Reagan. We saw it a lot over the last several years. But what would it look like if the church really embraced the greatest teachings of Jesus, the invitation, the commandment, and the commission to live this out? How do we become great again? To truly live out love for our neighbor, we must share the love of Jesus in all ways. We become great by living love out. When I look at how the world sees the church today, they really don't want anything. And by the world, I mean the Western world, where we live. How the United States and our neighbors see church as a whole. It is completely ancillary, potentially auxiliary, to the way of life. Unnecessary. We don't need church to live well. And a lot of times when you listen to your neighbors, like your neighbors on the street, a lot of times when the church gets involved, everything gets messed up. And instead of people knowing who we love and why we love, they know more about what we're against than what we're for. So to truly become great, we have to live out the love of Jesus in every venue of life. We have to take the love of Jesus and express that love to others. And that expression is not going to be the same person to person, whether the one who is showing it or the one receiving it. But we have to express love. We can't hold it back. We've got to let love shine through. We've got to take uh, the love of Jesus and tell others about his love. Like, we're so afraid to tell people about Jesus because someone's going to get offended somewhere. Maybe if I just started with, did you know that God loves you just the way you are? If Mr. Rogers can do it, I know God does it. Because Mr. Rogers got his words from the Lord as a faithful believer in Jesus. I love you just the way you are. Will God call us to change in his time and his way? Yes. God does not pursue the righteous. He pursues the sinner. 
secret to that is, is we're all sinners. And he's pursuing all of us. God loves you in spite of you. One of my favorite verses comes from Romans. While I was God's enemy. Not God's friend. While I was God's enemy, Jesus died for the ungodly. We have to tell people that they don't have to stay far from God. We have to express and tell them the good news of Jesus. Not just show it, also tell them. It goes hand in hand. We have to model Jesus' love for others. The greatest responsibility I have as a dad who calls Jesus king is to model love to my kids. Before anybody else, like to model what that love of Christ looks like forward, that's where it is. Model Jesus' love. We have to take that world. Jesus' love for the world is only exclusive if Jesus' followers make it so. What do I mean by that? Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. He says, um, for God so loved all the world that all of that world, whosoever would believe in him, would not perish but have everlasting life. There is an inclusive dynamic to that. To believe in Jesus is to receive the express love of God. But do you know the limitations of God's love? It's infinite. And yet there are times when we will put limits to God's love on others. Making expectations and demands of them that maybe Jesus doesn't make of himself on that side of faith. In short, the only people we will fail to impact with Jesus' love are the people we refuse to go to. Because Jesus says, go into all the world. So who are the people we don't go to? Strippers, gamblers, prostitutes, addicts. People of different skin tones, people of different languages, people of different beliefs, people who support the Packers, or people who support the Vikings or the Cowboys. The only people we will not impact in the love of Christ are the people we refuse to go to. To get the great commandment lived well, we have to live out the great commission. They go hand in hand. So what do we do? That? How do we do that? My missional focus, here's where it gets down to. And that kind of, that logo-looking piece in the corner of the screen are three words. And those three words are going to help us understand how we live this out. Compassion, purpose, and relationship. To find my missional focus. Who am I going to love? How am I going to love? When and where am I going to love? This is where it comes from. What stirs my soul? What do I see as the, the greatest need in my community. We're all going to see something different, by the way. It's compassion. What stirs you when you go through your community? Sometimes that stirring can feel like anger. We get mad about stuff that we see. Sometimes that, that compassion can feel like sadness. I'm so sad this is happening. Sometimes it can be invigorating. Oh, that's happening. Let's go do something. Let's, let's make it happen. Those emotions work there, but they unfold compassion. Like, like what stirs your soul when it comes to the world around you? Your most immediate world with your coworkers, your community, your neighbors. What stirs you? Where do you find compassion? What skills, talents, and experiences do you bring with you? Like we all have different variations of this. We're all sitting in the same room this morning, but I can guarantee you of all the ears hearing today, we're all hearing something a little bit differently. My words have all been the same. But the impact of it is going to be received because of who you are. Right? So what skills, talents, and experiences do you bring? Those things start to identify your purposes. How can you unfold those? I can't see straight lines, by the way. I could never bring carpentry skills with me. My eyes, because of head injuries and in football, don't work together. I actually see two different lines. I can't draw straight without a ruler. Most people probably can't either, but still. So me bringing carpentry skills, although I follow Jesus, those two things don't work together. Now, you need sledgehammer skills? I may be your guy. I do a really good job of breaking stuff. Jamarcus keeps our sledgehammer under lock and key here at Cornerstone. 
But what skills do you have? Because every single one of us have experiences and skills and talents that we can bring. Every single one of us. And your neighbor needs you. Your community needs you. In just the way you can be. Who do I know? Who do I know who is impacted by this or interested in this too? How do I bring relationships along the way with that? Not only who am I doing it with and for, but who also do I know who can come with me into this? They may have different skills and talents and experiences, but a similar passion, and that starts to group together in relationship, and they don't have to believe in Jesus to share that place with you. Because how you live out your faith and that relationship with others is going to be the greatest modeling of Jesus' love in their lives. And we, we take those pieces of compassion and purpose and relationship and we find our places. This is where I can best impact or where I want to impact or what God's doing. And then go do it and be commissioned into that space because Jesus said all authority belongs to him, therefore go. But sometimes we don't know where to go or what to do. So that missional focus by taking those three components is going to help you go, this is how I can best love my community and extend that commandment forward. And if we do that, if we do that, Jesus' name will be lifted high. And the world will see him as great. And at the end of the day, exalting Jesus is what life is all about. And helping our neighbors into that relationship with him. That's it. 